plan now for market news. Asian markets were mixed today after US President Donald Trump's tax reform bill finally passed through Congress, giving him a much-needed legislative victory. With the uncertainty out of the way, some traders decided to cash in. Tokyo's main stock market closed lower, tracking a fall on Wall Street. Traders were unmoved by the Bank of Japan's de decision to keep its ultra-loose monetary policy in place. The Nikkei dropped by 0.1%. Hong Kong and Shanghai stocks ended higher, bucking a regional trend. Dealers welcomed Chinese lenders' uh, leaders' uh, vow to boost imports and further open markets as part of a drive to realign the economy. The Hang Seng Index added 0.4%. The benchmark Shanghai Composite Index climbed by almost 0.4%. And over in the United States, uh, Wall Street's main indexes dipped yesterday after both houses of Congress approved a long-anticipated tax overhaul. The bill passed the House a second time by 224 votes to 201, with no Democrats uh, backing it and a dozen House of Republicans voting no. The measure now heads to President Trump's desk for his signature. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell by 0.1 percent. The S&P 500 lost 0.08 percent. The Nasdaq Composite Index dropped by 0.04 percent. Well, the Osher Index was again in positive territory today, with mining counters lending most of the support. The losers on the bourse today have been the financial counters. This may be a reaction by some investors concerned about the ANC's latest resolution to amend the Constitution to apply expropriation without compensation under certain circumstances. This has raised questions about security of land tenure, with the financial sector currently heavily invested in the agricultural sector. Meanwhile, the local currency continues to hover around 1270 against the US dollar where it stood at the New York close. Let's take a look at the indicators. Well, today our discussion focus will be on the policy resolutions of the ANC at their national conference and how these will likely impact the economy and markets. And to break this down, I'm joined by Dr. Azaj Amin, he's Chief Economist at Econometrics. Thanks for joining us, sir. Thank you, Nampu. Good stuff. Now, the ANC has resolved to amend Section 25 of the Constitution in order to achieve expropriation without compensation. And it said that the absolute condition is that they'll do this so long as it's sustainable. What's your feeling about it? You know, in one way, the fact that they said they will only do it if it's sustainable uh, kind of waters down the potential impact because there is a fear that if they introduce this, especially in the agricultural sector, it could see farmers leaving their lands and uh, uh, that could jeopardize food security. Uh, there's also no deadline on when such a change in the Constitution would be affected. But, you know, one is concerned that it just s may send the wrong message to foreign investors and say that the security of tenure of land is not uh, great in South Africa. There's no mention about whether this will apply to all land or just agricultural land. Mm. So, I mean, could they, you know, the fear is could they come to one's home and take it, away, take it away without compensation at some stage? A lot in the up in the air and they still have to do feasibility studies and so on. So it's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty. One understands what's driving this. It is an incredibly emotive uh, subject. And uh, clearly, the, I think the ANC is trying to prepare for uh, the 2019 general election and making sure that it carries the support of a lot of the masses who feel they are uh, being uh, 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 undermined by not being able to have land that should have been available to them 
uh, by according to their South Africa's history. Indeed, indeed. Now, the ANC also resolved to have the Reserve Bank nationalised. Nationalisa nationalisation, pardon me, is often seen as a dirty word by markets. But in this instance, isn't the Reserve Bank's function determined by the Constitution? So does ownership structure really matter? You're absolutely correct. Ownership structure really does not matter. We happen to be one of only seven central banks in the world that are not 100% owned by the government. So the fact that we are 90% owned by the government and 10% by the private sector is neither here nor there. And the independence of the Reserve Bank is enshrined in the Constitution. And therefore, I think this is again uh, possibly slightly a watered down version of trying to play to the masses and to tr curry favour uh, to those who favour nationalisation by saying we're going to nationalise the Reserve Bank. But uh, actually, in the long and the short of it, it's not going to have much impact, even if they go ahead with such a move. Now, last Saturday, uh, President Jacob Zuma, he dropped that bombshell telling us that uh, uh, from next year, from January, uh, students in tertiary education who are from poor and working class families will get free education to the extent of even being fed for free. Um, now, the ANC has endorsed this move, which means that it should be kicking in next year. So the question is, are we going to be able to financially f afford it as South Africa Inc? And what implications does it have for the fiscus and ultr ultimately the way that we're perceived by the ratings agencies? Estimates are that the s this move will cost in the region uh, between 12 and 15 billion rand. Now, that is very, that is substantial, but it's not completely uh, 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 destructive of the fiscus. But uh, I think it will be seen by ratings agencies as being uh, a sign of an abandonment of fiscal consolidation and uh, pandering to the wishes of the population as a, uh, as a whole. What I find very sad about it is that it's misdirected because the real effort should be at improving early childhood development and primary school education because as a study, uh, international study showed last week, only 22% uh, of our grade four children can actually understand what they're reading. And that feeds through into matriculating, getting a certificate of matriculation but not being ready to uh, for university, and then entering the university system, getting the subsidy, and not getting through the university system. More than half of those entering the university or the tertiary education system do not complete their studies. So you really are uh, throwing good money after bad in this sense. Hmm. And um, another thing that's uh, being looked at uh, is the wealth tax, a wealth tax, uh, which would probably be transmitted through some sort of a land tax. Do you think that we're going to see tax avoidance measures among the rich or those who own land? Without a doubt, the more you try and tax people, the more they'll try and avoid that tax. And you're likely to see uh, efforts at trying to avoid such a tax. Many would argue that the very high rates that some of them pay on their properties are already a form of wealth tax and land tax. But uh, yes, I think it will simply incite more tax avoidance. But uh, I understand where it's coming from. The government is desperately short of money from um, uh, tax revenue to finance its expenditure and is looking for ways of uh, doing that. I think there are possibly more constructive ways and easier ways of actually raising larger amounts of money than with a an increase in land tax. Well, we'll reserve that conversation for another occasion. But I suppose it's quite difficult for the government to sort of justify themselves. And we have the Auditor General coming out every year talking about money missing to the tune of about 26 billion rand. And then the next year, we're told by government we need to raise 15 billion rand through tax hikes. Nompu, when you're talking about an increased pension for tax avoidance, that's exactly what is driving it. Uh, people are happy to pay tax if they're seeing it be being well spent. And until a few years ago, by and large, South Africa was very, South Africans were amongst the most compliant taxpayers in the world. But with the uh, eruption of evidence of state capture and corruption in recent years, that uh, inclination to be willing to keep paying tax 
has been greatly undermined and we're seeing greater efforts now to try and avoid tax. Now, this is quite critical, um, Dr. Jamin. When it comes to effecting policy over the next 18 months, who's boss, President Jacob Zuma or Cyril Ramaphosa? Well, and so long as President Zuma is uh, president of the country, he dictates who's going to be in the cabinet and how big the cabinet's going to be. And uh, he's a deployee of the ANC, and he's been—he—he—it's been said at the ANC that a deployee of the ANC must listen to ANC dictates and mandates. Uh, well, that may well be the case, but <laughs> Ramaphosa is also a deployee of the ANC. And the question that one asks oneself, and this is where, um, uh, you know, the, the organization is totally divided, almost 50-50, between those uh, wanting to come down strongly on state capture and corruption and willing to adopt market-friendly economic policies and those wanting more government involvement and then greater inclination to actually use uh, underhand means of gaining access to uh, public funds. And I don't know even whether it's Zuma or Ramaphosa, wh whoever it is will have a great difficulty in actually implementing uh, policies. And one's fear is that with the organization as divided as it is, you will end up with a bit of paralysis in economic policy and a continuation of more of the same that is not conducive towards higher economic growth. Fortunately, there is enough resilience, underlying resilience in the economy not to let it allow it to collapse completely. But we are look, trying to lift the growth rate to an extent of create, to be able to create jobs and uh, el uh, reduce poverty and inequality. And I don't know with a stalemate in economic policy whether we'll ever manage to get there. That's uh, not a good prognosis, but thank you so much for your insights and your time. Well, that was uh, Dr. Jamin, uh, Dr. Azar Jamin. He's chief economist at Econometrics, and after a short break, Nzinga will have more business news for you.